most influential people in the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Merrigan for the talk today. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to um, come clean on that hundred most influential people in the world. You're like, wow, I and I've never even heard of her before, right? <laughs> so. Um, I was living in Washington as a deputy secretary, number two position at the Department of Agriculture. And uh, Time Magazine called my office to say that they wanted to bestow this honor on me. And I told my staff, please do not return the call. <laughs> this is just some prankster. If you're watching the Borat thing now, you know what I'm <laughs> Some prankster who wants to out the big headed people in Washington who, who think that they're that important. Please don't return the call. So it took a couple weeks of pursuit before we finally did. Um, find out that it was true, and then I, I couldn't believe it. And then my head got bigger and bigger. <laughs> and uh, like, what am I going to wear to the red carpet gala? Uh, how wicked important am I? I'm from Massachusetts originally. We say wicked important a lot. And uh, then a friend uh, provided a very leveling experience for me. He looked at the magazine when it came out, and Lady Gaga is on the cover. And he's like, okay, I get the company you keep, Lady Ag Ag. <laughs> you put me in my place. It is a great pleasure to be here, and it is with great joy that I join the ASU community. I have been a part of ASU for nearly two months now, and every day I've learned new things and found colleagues that really excite me. I think we're going to do a lot of wonderful stuff. So it's a critical time, and Food and Agriculture Policy at a crossroads. I chose that title deliberately. Natural resource degradation, soaring diabetes, the, we're on the cusp of the first wave of climate refugees from these small island countries in search of greater food security. Now then, more, you know, now more than ever, we need to find innovative, uh, community-inspired solutions to achieve sustainability in the food and agriculture sector. But tough, the tough choices are ahead. I really do believe that. And so here at ASU, we need to develop the science, technology, the policy rationale, the communication and implementation strategies to help society change course and take the roads less taken. Another Massachusetts problem. You're from Massachusetts, you quote him in every speech you can. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about who we are. Now, many of you in this room uh, know ASU's footprint in food and agriculture better than me, since I've just been a sun devil for a short amount of time. But for those of you who may not, a brief on our history. Three years ago, faculty came together to organize the Food Systems Transformation <coughs> Initiative, uh, supported in large part by the School of Sustainability. Well, of course, that makes sense, right? Uh, more and more, when I go to meetings around sustainability, Food and agriculture are central to all of the discussions. Uh, and for example, when you look across the sustainable development goals, as I do frequently, food and agriculture issues are embedded more or less in every one of those 17 goals. So the Food Systems Transformation Initiative, which I say is FSTI, people around campus in the know use the acronym. <clears throat> It's benefits for, from so much faculty engagement, and it's proven to be a powerful incubator. Part of that was laying the groundwork for the Sweetie Center to be born. And now FSTI will morph into the Sweetie Center, and I'm pleased to report that Chris Wharton from the College of Health Solutions, who has been a leader of FSTI, will continue to play a leadership role in our new organization. Of course. It took the vision and philanthropy of Kelly and Brian Sweetie to create the new Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Brian, as you likely know, is an ASU alum and longtime supporter of this university. He and Kelly started a vegan organic meal company, Sweet Earth Foods, which they sold to Nestle last fall. They took some of those proceeds and immediately called President Crow and said, we'd like to start a Center on Sustainable Food Systems. Bravo. They're still running their company, um, but I am convinced, I am certain, that, good, that they're going to carve out the time necessary to be great champions of all that we do and be part of the team. 
I'm having lunch with them on Thursday. <laughs> So food systems, we're the Sweetie Center on Sustainable Food Systems. So brief reflection and what we mean by food system seems in order. This is a fairly recent, and I'm sorry if you can't see in the back, I'm going to put all these up on our website that will um, be up online soon. Uh, this is a fairly recent diagram from the USDA on what a community food system looks like. And I put S on the top of this community food systems because People do not define a food system in one way. I don't know if that's necessarily problematic, but I just want to make that point. And when I look at this diagram, the first thing that strikes me is I don't see wasted food as a part of the diagram. And I'm sure many of you in the room are familiar with an FAO report that came out a few years ago that said something like, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest country. You know, it's a huge issue. Forty percent of food is wasted really differently between developing and developed economies, but we know there's such opportunity there. It's not in the diagram. Another thing I don't see in this diagram is gender. Right, not in the U.S., but around the world, women are the farmers who prepared our food, who produce our food. And there was a great report that came out a few years ago from FAO World Bank that said if women were given same access to education, leadership roles, credit, things like land tenure, food production would likely increase by 30% or the equivalent of feeding 150 people a day. Gender. So I don't want to say that this is a perfect diagram or that the Swedish Center will necessarily come up with the perfect diagram, but the message is there's no single, single bullet, there's no single lever to pull, um, no single focus that will sufficiently transform our food and system. And that here at the Sweetie Center, we're going to embrace the complexity uh, and have systems thinking at the core of all that we do. And speaking of transdisciplinary research, you probably recognize this cartoon. It's uh, conjuring up the old parable about the blind man and the elephant. And this to me captures the challenge in academia broadly and something I know the School of Sustainability thinks about quite a bit. And the story goes, if these uh, people are blind, they happen to all be men in this illustration, <laughs> uh, they each feel their own part of the elephant. And when they're asked to describe what they feel, what they, what, what, what's the world like, it's really different if you're feeling the trunk versus the tail versus the, the leg. And it's become a real um, way to describe to people why it's important to bring multiple disciplines to the table, but we're really trying to solve uh, challenges of sustainability. So I'm really excited to be here at Sweetie because that's sort of in your DNA. And just looking at the Food Systems Transformation Initiative, there are faculty from across the university. Um, we're going to we're going to gather more in our pursuit of great things. But what a wonderful start! And and um, I'm so glad to be here. So, um, in my talk today, I want to first briefly describe six activities underway already at the Sweetie Center. Uh, second, I want to discuss the Farm Bill, because it is the season, and then reflect on a handful of issues that I'm excited to explore. So, well, we'll take issue number one. So, I've seen this huge upsurge in interest across the country in food. Uh, and sustainable food systems in particular, and especially at the student level. So you're seeing a whole um, number of new courses being offered across the university space, new degrees, and despite all of that, when I look across the landscape, I see a really big gap in programs that are delivering in-depth curriculum understanding of food policy. And if we want to really change things in a big way, we need people to know how to go into policy environments and do the job. And um, so that's the first thing I want to tell you about, that part of my vision is that we will have a food policy and leadership and sustainability certificate. And I really appreciate my two friends in the front row, Lisa and Caroline, who have been helping on that, among others. Um, I piloted this program at George Washington University last year to great success. This is one of my fellows 
from an NGO in Georgia in front of the U.S. Capitol, a bunch of my fellows in Congressman Jim McGovern's office talking to him. He's the foremost champion in the House for Nutrition Assistance Programs. Um, they learned a lot. I learned a lot. And my vision is that we will have a 15 credit graduate certificate program, maybe starting as early next fall. My thinking is it will be a hybrid program, a mix of online education and in-person trainings that will be suitable for professionals as well as uh, your traditional graduate students. We're also thinking about uh, BS and MS and sustainable food systems. How would you like that many sun devils yeah. focused on food, huh? That's my favorite slide. So mm -hmm. I, I see Mark's here from the uh, Morrison Agribusiness School. I don't think I didn't see Chris at Wharton. I've talked to him in terms of what they're offering at the College of Health Solutions. But as we develop these degrees, I see that they are housed in the School of Sustainability, but they really will be bringing in experts, curriculum, energy from across the university. So, I'm just back from a meeting in New York City where a few of us, supported by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, came together to think about true cost accounting. So what's true cost accounting? It's a term that describes this universe of efforts to think systemically and determine the true cost of our food. What drives this is the fundamental belief that neither we nor our policymakers can make good choices if we don't have all the facts in hand. I've been part of a United Nations Environment Program initiative called TEAB AgriFood. That's a terrible name. We needed ASU branding guidance on that. <clears throat> Anyhow, TEAB AgriFood, I've been involved in the last three years, which has engaged 160 scholars across 33 countries to come up with a common framework for assessing, putting a value on externalities of food production, both positive and negative. Uh, one of our earliest diagrams is shown here. Our first report came out in June, and you can find it along with many materials at teabweb.org. Well, I'm proud of the work that was done. It's only the tip of the iceberg. I hope to continue pursuing this work, and in doing so, involve faculty and students across the university. It's a new horizon of scholarship with very practical and meaningful applications. Okay. A third area of concentration in these early days comes from my interest in farm-driven cuisine, a term coined by Chef Dan Barber and featured in his book, The Third Plate. So for students in the room, if you end up in one of my classes, you can, uh, you can count, you can put your money I'm being assigned the third plate. It is uh, perhaps the best in class food read I've encountered over the past decade. Dan's basic argument is that we need to adjust what we eat to reflect what can be sustainably produced. A chef's job is to curate and shift our palates. <laughs> I was at a restaurant last week, not a hardship, and very, very much enjoyed my beet steak, not beet, beet. Um, when Dan cooks, he puts vegetables in the center of the plate. And meat, for sustainability reasons, uh, meat, meats are sidelined with <laughs> condiments, gravies, small morsels. One of my favorite dishes he produces is rotational risotto. It uses all the crops from a soil building crop rotation so <coughs> nothing goes to waste and farmers prosper. What you see here is a squash experiment that Dan undertook with a professor plant breeder at Cornell, Mike Mazurik. Dan went to Mike and said, I would really like to breed, have you breed a squash for better taste. And Michael was really surprised. He said, no one's ever asked anything of that. Like me. Usually when you come to a breeder, you ask, um, breed for resistance, pest resistance. Well, that's or breed for yield, not breed for taste. And so um, Dan and, and Michael have gone on to found a whole new seed company on this notion that we need to produce better tasting food. I'm hoping to connect Dan with people in our nutrition department to work on pro food profiles 
And I think this area of inquiry has great promise. So you heard in the introduction that I've been affiliated with organic agriculture starting back in, dare I say, the year 1988, when I worked for Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, and he asked that I draft legislation to establish national standards for organic food. The law passed as part of the 1990 Farm Bill, and the organic marketplace has grown exponentially ever since. In 2016, uh, Nielsen undertook a survey to figure out how many American families buy organic food, and it concluded that nationally, um, the average is a little over 80% of American families, but organic food at least once in that calendar year. Interestingly, that percentage is 90% in Arizona, one of the highest in the country. So it's all been good, kind of. What I see now is a splintering in the industry with several competing label claims that overlap with organic and which confuse consum consumers. I think part of this comes from the fact that organic has become big business, and that's uncomfortable for some organic leaders. Organic is no longer viewed as the alternative to the mainstream, and major corporations are engaged in the sector. I remember years ago when I was profiled in a Washington Post story about organic agriculture, and the re reporter had to ask the prerequisite question. Do you wear Birkenstocks? <laughs> that was cold. That was cold, right? Are you a crazy lefty liberal? Well, times have changed. I should hasten to say that um, some of the angst about organic these days and some of these labeling efforts also spring from legitimate concerns over the quality of current standards and their enforcement. I would like to see us position the Sweetie Center as an unbiased expert voice for all things organic. And I'm in conversation with organic leaders right now about this, both NGOs and, and private industry. Fifth, I want to work with industry on finding roads to a more sustainable food and ag sector. From what I can tell, ASU has a great history of working in partnership with industry, and I expect to follow suit. Right now, especially at the federal level, there is very little going on that is creative in the policy realm. Well, my kind of creativity, anyhow. And, yeah, okay. So get off track that way. <laughs> that doesn't mean that we can disengage entirely in efforts to provide the kind of analysis that helps policymakers do their jobs well. But more and more, I'm excited by the energy in the private sector for promoting change. Some of it's driven by the Silicon Valley types who've made their fortunes and now want to take, take their disruptive thinking to the food and ag sector. Come on, we love it. Um, venture capital is abundant now uh, for startups, and it's difficult to keep track of it all. You can't see this, but this was a 2016 map that this Food Tech Connect put out, <coughs> just sort of showing all of the different new food businesses that were blasting onto the scene. At the same time, we're seeing some food giants shifting their thinking. Some recognize how inert their structures are and are setting up their own venture capital arms, for example, Tyson. Um, some recognize that the way that they're going to move ahead is by gobbling up businesses to refresh their overall portfolio. Think General Mills buying Annie's. Which helped, which helped the corporation bolster its bottom line significantly. Most recently, we've seen a number of companies start to decamp the Grocery Manufacturers Association, long-time trade association. And four of these companies, uh, Mars, Danone, Unilever, and Nestle, set up a new organization, the Sustainable Food Policy Alliance. <coughs> what I have in my head, what I'm trying to figure out is, how can the Sweetie Center support these industry shifts to sustainability? Lots to think about there. Sorry, I've been on a plane all day, kind of dried out there. So this brings to me to my sixth early on activity. I call it raising the ASU flag. <coughs> As some of you may know, I'm not moving to Tempe till next summer. I want to see my youngest through his senior year of high school. So I'm working from the new ASU building 
his first academic year. Just pebble throw from the White House. It's outstanding. If you get to BC, you have to visit. But this gives me, us really, a great opportunity to announce ourselves to the world. I was on the faculty for eight years at Tufts University. Like ASU, a place with world-class research and education in the food and ag space, but sometimes overlooked because it is not a land-grant university. We have announced, and Rin Jim is in here, maybe she's left it. Thank you. This is her idea. I'm crediting you all over the space here. Hopefully it works out, huh? <laughs> we have announced that we'll be holding five events this year on the eighth floor pavilion of our DC building, focused on the future of food. <clears throat> In this first event, which will occur October 10th, <coughs> I'll be joined by Brad Fiegel of Mars, one of the founders of that Sustainable Food Policy Alliance. He's in the middle there. Allison Knopf of Agrilist. She is the CEO of a great software analytics company that's focused on controlled environment atmosphere, uh, agriculture operations. And James Rogers, the CEO of Appeal. <coughs> to the left there. He has developed, he's a scientist, and he's developed a, a way, a process to preserve food, goes right to the food waste issue, by using natural plant compounds to provide a coating to make those uh, fruits and vegetables last longer. And the first thing that rolled out across the country through Costco was avocados. And for those of us who have had avocados spoiled in our kitchen, we're going to love this. <laughs> Anyhow, um, they've agreed to come and join me to talk about uh, opportunities for positive change, which is great. Um, and I'm also using it as a way to signal that the Sweetie Center wants to engage with industry in these discussions. Our next event is scheduled for December 10th, and the focus of that event will be global food security. Okay, the Farm Bill. Oh my God. I'm going to take a drink. Speak in my tone. Okay. All right. So a little background to begin. <coughs> Let's first look at these dates here on the right side of the slide. These are years that farm bills have become laws. We were due to pass a farm bill by midnight yesterday, September 30th, the end of the federal fiscal year. When I was deputy secretary, I would be at my work table. <coughs> in my office until midnight on September 30th, obligating funds to the very last moment you could. So September 30th is a big date in, federal, in the federal government. The Farm Bill didn't make it. The House and Senate have been conferencing, trying to come up with a compromise bill for final passage, but there are very significant differences between the House and the Senate passed Farm Bills, especially as they pertain to the SNAP program. I've been on a plane all day today, so I don't know the absolute latest, but last I knew there wasn't even resolution on what kind of extension to have. <coughs> um, Congress is still in session, and with all the craziness around the um, potential confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh, maybe the Senate will be not even longer than anticipated. We'll see. By the way, I never thought we'd get a farm bill this year, unless it happened um, in the lame duck session after a Democratic win in the House. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> but fear not, however, we've been here before, and that's evidenced by the years on this slide, which do not neatly align with the expected five-year farm bill cycle. <coughs> Another important background piece of information is this pie chart. Now, this is uh, the projected cost of the House proposed farm bill. The Farm Bill is expected to be around $860 billion, more or less, depending on what's uh, enacted, and that's over a 10-year period. Um, it doesn't matter what pie chart we look at. The main point, whether it's House or Senate, and even if it was last Farm Bill or this Farm Bill, the main point is the same, that is nutrition assistance, primarily SNAP, which is represented in this gray part of the pie chart, is the biggest beneficiary, ranging in years from 78 to 83 percent of overall Farm Bill dollars. For this reason, some people have argued that the Farm Bill should be renamed the Food and Farm Bill to better communicate the bulk that the bulk of the money <coughs> good, 
goes to support activities not directly related to food production. <coughs> Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It seems like every time people say that, then they have to say, comma, formerly known as food stamps. <laughs> the whole point of poly staff was so it wouldn't be called food stamps anymore, but hopefully we're all on the same page. SNAP is a mandatory counter cyclical federal program, meaning that it goes down when the economy goes up and vice versa. I was Deputy Secretary at SNAP's all time high, with over 49 million people receiving benefits. Today, enrollment, I didn't check today, I uh, haven't checked recently, but um, I think enrollment is closer to 42 million. These charts are interesting. You can see that across the country, on this, on this uh, beige map, uh, across the country, SNAP enrollment declined between fiscal years 2013 and 2016. In Arizona, <coughs> it dropped between 10.1 and 13, uh, no, between 10 and 20 percent. But going down generally, because the economy is going down. The other map shows you the actual enrollment in fiscal year 2017. You can see then in Arizona, it's 10.1 to 13 percent of people in this state receive staff benefits. Of course, with recent news that the federal government is considering denial of citizenship applications, from people who have accepted federal assistance like SNAP and WIC, I anticipate that we will see enrollment decline further. Not because of an improving economy, but because of fear. This is tragic because people receiving these benefits are primarily children, elderly, and the disabled. And contrary to public perception, by the way, most beneficiaries are white and living in rural communities. SNAP is the main farm bill battle because of cost, but not entirely so. Some of it is basic philosophical views. Because the economy is good and SNAP costs less, there's more money to spend on traditional farm programs, so things aren't as tight. But that doesn't satisfy all legislators who contend that there are integrity problems with the program. They remember hearing about that one lottery winner, one year, one time, out of how many millions of people, who somehow was able to retain staff benefits. Um, and that, that, that they pointed those things as evidence of um, overall program reform needs. The biggest battle right now is about work requirements for staff recipients, with House, the House Farm Bill imposing requirements that the Senate and all Democrats impose. There are other unresolved issues, too. On the commodity program front, big differences remain. The House bill would penalize farmers who convert marginal land to grass-based agriculture and or who adopt resource-conserving crop rotations that include forages and alternative crops. Thankfully, the Senate bill does not contain these anti-environmental provisions. <coughs> A perennial farm bill uh, favorite, battle of mine, is payment limitations. And once again, it has reared its ugly head. And this is about who's eligible to receive up to $125,000 per year in farm <coughs> subsidies of various sorts. The Senate bill would limit a farm operation to $250,000 in farm payments. Ma and Pa and McDonald's, for example. The House would allow unlimited multiples of that $125,000 check. The letter on this slide, sent last week by a bunch of members of both the House and the Senate, a bipartisan letter, discusses how cousins and distant relatives could receive those checks. But it's worse than that. Even if you're not actively engaged in a farm, but own it in some fashion, the house would allow you to receive a check. This issue, this single issue, I believe, has done more to give farmers a bad name than any other. It has turned off regular non-farm people from the idea of providing financial support to farmers. And I get it. Back to the need for some kind of farm bill extension, over a billion dollars is frozen because there is no farm bill, meaning money already in the bank, so to speak, for programs like uh, the CSP, the Conservation Reserve Program, the Ag Conservation Easement Program, I'm a little nerd in Washington, um, for these programs that the money can't go out the door. 
So you think, well, we'll be there eventually because it's in this conceptual bank, right? What's the stress? Well, it certainly hurts farmers because it hinders their ability to plant. We are coming upon that time of year when um, next year's crops and all aspects of the farm are decided. It does hurt. And then there's these tiny but mighty programs, to borrow a phrase from the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, that in total uh, amount to about $140 million a year in, in the world that I've operated in that sort of chicken feed. Um, but they're the grease, these programs are the grease that I've listed several of them here, uh, the 10 programs, I guess. Um, this, these are the programs that really get sustainable agriculture operations up and running from organic support to value-added producer grants to farmers' market support. They're no longer authorized. September 30th was the last day for these programs, so it's worse than a phase. So that's a very quick farm bill summary. Yeah, that's it really quick, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'm excited to learn all about Arizona agriculture. When I accepted the position as SME Center Director, I immediately went to the Bible, which some of us know as the Census of Agriculture, to learn about my new home state. Perhaps this crowd knows all that I know. I'm sure you do. But interestingly for me, nationally, Arizona ranks 32nd in terms of total value of ag products so sold. <coughs> now, this is based on the last ag census, which was taken in 2012. And we just completed, it happens every five years, we just completed the last <coughs> census, but it takes usually the department a year or two to aggregate the data and, and get out the word. So this is the latest information that, that we have. So um, we were 32nd and total value of our product sold, but there are two areas where we kind of bump up significantly in numbers. Fifth in the total value um, of ag in veggies, melons, potatoes, sweet potatoes, that category. And 10th in total value in the category of cotton and cottonseed, one category, and the other, horses, ponies, mules, euros, furrows, and donkeys. <laughs> okay, well, I've got a lot to work. Um, I am aware, and you should be too, that Arizona has one member of Congress who sits on the House Agriculture Committee, Tom O'Halloran, but none on the Senate Ag Committee or on either the House or the Senate uh, Appropriations Committees. This can matter when we have a particular state issue of concern that needs to be elevated to the federal level. So right now, this is our guy. When I was Deputy Secretary, I worked very closely with the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. Having worked in state government, both in Massachusetts and Texas, I'm keenly aware of how great a role the state can play in making sure this sector is strong and thriving. I'm looking forward to have the Sweeting Center be a source of expertise to support Arizona Food Net. So, just a few issues that are out there that are kind of hot that I think we should just put on our map. Uh, the first is shifting land patterns. So, there are a series of maps that you can Google. In fact, Michael Crow sent me one very late at night. <laughs> I was already aware. I was very glad I was already aware, but. Um, anyhow, they're very interesting. They're, they, they were, it's a project from Alan Burgos, a longtime um, ag reporter and colleague. And this is the culminating map showing really uh, how is America's land used. And that big yellow block, is, the biggest part is cows, pasture, range, then you sheep, goats, other horses, farm sets. The, whoops, I guess I. I must have very powerful hands. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, <laughs> it's just, control. It's okay. Oh, you guys, that is you're so modern. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, it, 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 I mean, up here, the pink um, is housing, urban housing, urban commercial, rural housing. So it gives you a sense of how important it is. But when I think about this map, I think about what's going on now. Um, if you're a soybean farmer with what's been going on in trade wars, you're thinking differently about things, maybe open to new things. I don't know. Time will tell. Depends on how long those things drag on. We've got climate change already. Uh, two or three years back, USDA put out a new crop hardiness zone map showing that people are going to have to start thinking about moving crops uh, where they go. And then we have increasing urban, urbanization around the world. Um, and then here's the thing I always think about, right? 
you know the federal government recommendation, the plate, used to be the, the guy the pyramid, right? You know what we're supposed to be eating? Deborah, what are we supposed to be eating? You do know. Half a plate of fruits and vegetables, right? <laughs> half a plate. The reality is, almost no Americans are eating half a plate of fruits and vegetables. So I think, what about tomorrow? What if everyone woke up and said, I'm going to follow the dietary guidelines, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to eat half a plate? Well, we have no way to produce anywhere near that. In fact, over the last 10, 15 years, we have been importing more and more fruits and vegetables. Not because we're eating more and more fruits and vegetables, really because in some ways we're producing less. And some of that has to do with labor needs. And with unresolved immigration uh, policies, a lot of um, farming operations are shifting to other countries because, because they have to. So anyhow, I'm really interested in this topic if people want to play around with, with, uh, with me. That would be great. Alternative well, proteins. So, my husband's really very concerned that I'm going to be slipping some cricket flour and something else. <laughs> Maybe he should be. <laughs> but I do think that we need to be thinking about all kinds of alternative proteins. We all know that when economies develop, people start eating more meat. And that has severe sustainability consequences, as people in this room well know. Um, when I just think about insect protein, uh, you know, 6%, I think I remember the statistic, right? I could be making it up. But I think it's 6% of wild-caught fish, it's all those little tiny species we need for the overall food chain, 6% of overall um, fish caught goes to um, Aquaculture, fish farming, right? I think the fish might like a little mealworm. I hear they're delicious. So we don't even have to force feed my husband cricket flour, but I do think there are opportunities to think about initially uh, fish meal, pet food, all kinds of things around alternative protein. And she's got really interesting stuff going on around algae that I want to learn a lot more about. The Impossible Burger is just one of many different kinds of burgers on the scene that are not meat. It's actually a genetically engineered product, and it tastes so much like meat that vegetarians don't really like it. <laughs> By the way, um, the appropriations bill for agriculture that funds many ag programs part of what some people refer to as a minibus, a large, multifaceted, continuing resolution that keeps money flowing through December 7th, was enacted because the appropriators couldn't resolve a number of what we call policy riders on the appropriations bills, contentious issues, one being cell-based meat. And if you're watching this across the country, um, they, the meat industry is pushing back on some of these cell, cellular meat, saying you can't use that word meat, with I think the first law prohibiting um, the word meat used in that context passing in Missouri. The future, global food security, right? I mean, I grew up more domestic focused, I admit to that, but there's no such thing as domestic policy or domestic agriculture, domestic food and agriculture anymore. It's one big global community. <laughs> and we know, looking out, that we're going to have more and more people. We're going to need more food. We have more climate change, more urbanization. And by the way, I go to a lot of these ag meetings, and it's almost like a chant that people start with, that we are going to have to produce 70% you know, more food because the world population is going to be 10 or 11 billion, blah, blah, blah. I don't necessarily buy into that, by the way. I think we have to be a lot smarter. But right now, we produce enough food to feed the world, and yet we have a little over 800 million people who are hungry. So it's, it's more complicated than just increasing yields. It's about gender. It's about corruption. It's about distribution systems. It's about waste. It's so many things. Um, but we're going to have to get smarter. We know that. And at the same time, we're going to have less land, less water, and less resiliency. Yeah, I'm wrapping up. Nice high note, right? <laughs> I just want to say, 
I'm excited to be on the university campus because of this book, among other things, called uh, Generation Young, A Taste of Generation Young. And it's a book that's fun. It's all about young people and their obsession with food and how they think differently about food, how they define themselves, almost an identity politics around food. And um, so I believe that young people are going to save us from ourselves. <laughs> Finally, I want to say it's solutions, not problems. So I'm really interested in this 2015 Knight Foundation study of millennials and voting. And um, what they found was millennials through a bunch of focus groups. Respond that some messages that are positive, that elicit pride in their city, that are framed in how voting can positively impact issues they care about. They're less receptive to messages that are negative and cynical, and are especially tired of hearing that the system is broken. That really made me pause because I go to so many meetings these days, days where people start out by saying the food system is broken. Well, that may resonate with some people, but it may not bring in the crowds. So, just looking across the ASU website, I come across the word solutions constantly. It's the Walton Sustainability Solutions Initiative. It's the Sustainability Solutions Festival. It's the College of Health Solutions, College of Public Services and Community Solutions. I'm sure the list can go on and on. It's more than a word. I believe it is the ASU mindset, and I'm all in. When I was a professor at Tufts, I used to assign my very brilliant graduate students this end of year paper and it took me a couple of years to realize that they would bring it in, I turned it in and I'd read it and 80% of the paper described the problem, whatever that was. And 20%, if that much, talked about the solution. <coughs> and so I instituted a rule that at least 50% of the paper had to be about solutions. It's really reorienting how we think. So I hope you will join me in this exciting journey. Well, some say the food system is broken. We know that message is not inspiring, not the kind of motivation that gets young people to engage. Our message is going to be about innovation, excitement, change, endless possibility. We are at a crossroads, and with your help, the Sweetie Center will be. Thank you. All right, so now you have your way with me. Question. <laughs> yes? So you talked a lot about the transdisciplinarity of problems, and I'm wondering to what extent um, are you thinking about this sweet uh, center as really needing to interact like, most directly with different large-scale systems, like the food system. So, for example, energy system, uh, water system, the economy itself, like how do you intend to really in, like, intentionally actually bring those together in your whole research process, if at all? Um, absolutely. And it's about tapping the kind of experts that we have at ASU, both students and faculty to do the mind meld necessary to come up with those kind of solutions. Energy is certainly a part of it. Anyone who follows what it takes to irrigate a farm knows how important energy is. And if you drive through the Midwest, you see all those uh, wind turbines. Um, uh, you could be talking about biofuels. I mean, energy plays such a big role. Water. I'm going to have a whole different mindset about water moving to Arizona, right? <laughs> yes. Think about differently. So, um, also, being in Arizona, um, one thing that I really recognize is the extent to which we have uh, tribal nations here and how much of the land is tribal land. And that's a whole other thing to think about. So it's not even just people working together inside the university and our tribal liaisons, but also working with the community. That's sort of the vision. But do you see those as um, actually interfacing where you're addressing the problems? not just within the food system, but the energy system as well, for example? Or are you seeing them as like bringing in the experts to really focus on that food nexus? Yeah, so I, I think, well, <laughs> the food, energy, water nexus, as NSF says, um, I mean, I, our focus is going to be food. And I think all of those components are a part of it. But it's not that I'm going to start with my problems statement or quest to be about 
how I'm going to uh, rebuild the grid, the regional grid, so it's more resilient. I hope I have colleagues who think those things, but that's not my thing. Yes, sir. Well, the Sweetie Center be involved in food policy issues primarily on a national, regional, state level, or will you also be engaged in uh, working on solutions uh, here locally? And you've got internationally, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> so this first year we're going to be a, a mean, lean food operation. Uh, but once I get here on campus, we're hopefully going to build out and we'll have people, and we already have people with affiliated faculty, who work in all those dimensions. So uh, Joe was here. Yeah, you're doing some local some local stuff. She's, yeah. <laughs> um, with local communities. So it, dep it depends. It depends. Um, I don't see that there's any reason to choose, and particularly because a lot of the decisions that people make and a lot of the research that is undertaken um, there are no black line, thick line boundaries between those different levels. Yeah. Are you focused on policy or farmer education, uh, sustainable agriculture, making it better research? Do you have any focuses within those or is it all the above? Well, I, I would not, um, my particular um, strength, background is policy, obviously. Um, but I, I really need to better understand the assets here on campus before I can really map it out where we ultimately will land. But um, there's also opportunity to partner in different ways with our, do you call it a sister school? What do you, what's the terminology? Are we talking about? Or just you call it rival? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really good idea. Fair enough. But, but you know, the ag school there, uh, there's opportunities there. We, in some ways, we play um, different, um, sometimes overlapping, and sometimes complementary roles. So uh, ultimately, what we do, we want to do what's best for Arizona. So, so best for Arizona. Follow up question When you think about collaborating with industry companies, do you feel like it's going to be in the policy place? Or do you no, think I, think it, I, I think it will be a lot of different places. I think that it's really going to be about innovation. Innovation could sometimes be applicable to the policy sector, it could be about new technology, it could be about um, uh, new partnerships. So Broadly, innovation. I mean, I, it was not lost upon me that little a banner that's across everything that has done that. Number one, in innovation. Number two, Stanford. Number three, MIT. I'm going to rub that into my MIT colleagues' uh, face. Uh, that's very attractive to me, being at this university, and um, the sort of sense I get from everybody: you can try anything. Some of it's going to fail, but you shouldn't stop trying. You should have cut yourself out of the game before you try. So I really have this sense of um, a world without limits right now. Now, the reality will hit at some point, but that's, that's, that's my mindset now, in the way back. Uh, so in relation to the farm bill uh, this morning, there was an article in the New York Times with Wendell Berry, and he puts forward the year farm bill. Yes. And given that there, it is contentious right now, the farm bill, I'm wondering if the School of Sustainability and the Speedy Center should be pushing forward some of these ideas that are more ecological, more uh, sustainable in the long run, uh, or do you think this is a vision that's too um, I uh, love Wendell Berry, by the way. The Unsettling of America is one of my favorite books of all time, and I've certainly broken bread with Wendell on many occasions, as well as Wes Jackson, who is part of the visionary for that 50-year farm bill, who uh, until recently ran the Land Institute, so Selena gives us. Um, wonderful prairie festival if you ever get to go. What is really exciting for me in all of that is this vision of bringing back perennial crops. Perennialism. Wes Jackson brought to my office when I was deputy secretary this um, banner that I want to say was almost the length of this room, but you know, the other way, vertically. And it was about, a, it was a comparison, real life photos of, 
of root, root structures of plants based on how long they had been around to show a, how perennials can be such a great contributor to soil health, building soil. And uh, he wanted me to hang it up at, in USA in the central uh, courtyard there. <laughs> well, it's the beginning of the term, and um, just don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but after about a year and a half, I succeeded in pulling it off. Took lots of pictures because I was like, I don't know, and the dead of night is going to disappear. <laughs> but um, I think those are really important things to think about. And um, I talked about big differences between the House and Senate farm bills, and yes, there are big differences, but in the scheme of things, in the big picture, no. Really, um, pretty, pretty minor differences from year to year. Nothing radical about this farm bill. And if I had to say anything about my pals in the Sustainable Ag Movement that I've worked with over the years, is that we get so hung up on these tiny but mighty programs that sometimes we fail to take on the bigger beast. And part of that, I think, is because we don't have the depth of food policy uh, knowledge that's necessary to really unravel those commodity programs, to know what the, um, the CCE, CCE, CCC is, excuse me, <laughs> and um, some of the technicalities that the old farm hands know. So to change things, you really have to know the thing that you want to change first really well. And then you become empowered to screw around with it. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned venture capitalism. Will the SUNY Center provide um, resources for students and graduates to access this if they want to start small businesses? Well, that I do not know. <laughs> I think that there are likely some um, opportunities already here on campus to do that. And I know that is something that's going on around um, different college campuses. I do need to uh, prepare a budget, Meredith is helping me, and get that approved <laughs> before I can even, um, you know, did you give me a sun card? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there are certain things that I need to do before I can say exactly um, what funds we have and how they're going to be distributed. Don't mean to uh, dodge anything, I just, I really don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the follow-up question, it says on the money aspect and on the students aspect, I think so we are a group of students, grad students here who are very interested in food, and we are really excited about the, the SUNY Center and seeing how we can contribute. There are also undergrad students who are very interested in food and like to contribute. So I was wondering what's your vision of you know, involving students, because you talked about the new master's program, certificate, etc. But uh, yeah, so how do you plan on integrating students to the center? Just only through teaching or through research or um, well I, I would hope research and teaching I would expect that and more so in my last job at George Washington University I um, put out um, jobs for food policy fellows student food policy fellows who came and worked 10 to 20 hours a week in the office on Projects that were really interesting to them. So it wasn't like they were filing. If you saw my office, that would be proof that there was no <laughs> filing done. But um, one example of great success, three students, food policy fellows for me, uh, did an analysis of the food environment for students at George Washington University. It was a pretty well-researched, analyzed, a lot of data, came up with a very well-written report, submitted it to the college president, and within a week, he made some significant changes. So I think students can be incredibly powerful change makers. And I hope that at the Sweetie Center, we figure out how to help students do the kind of work that they are passionate about. Yes. And how far is food technology entering the development that was just a year rather than the center? And also, you talk about industry and relations to practice. And how far can small groups, which maybe just the all out of other venture capital funds, be a university part of the collaboration? So we saw the burger you just had up front there, we had the whole algae development and also on. But in how far is that relevant to your policy here that you're focusing on? Yeah, so I'm not sure. How's that for a very beautiful answer? Um, 
I'm involved in two venture capital efforts. Uh, and through that, I have gotten to know a lot of these CEOs of these new emerging companies. Just about three weeks ago, I was on board a boat in Norway visiting these giant salmon farms, talking sea lice. Also going to really exciting, inspirational bivalve operation and thinking about the future in a totally different way. So, again, there's all this energy in industry that, for me, feeling very positive now. And I haven't figured out what our role is, how to harness it, but it's in the game plan. And I'll look forward to hearing from all of you. If you have ideas, I mean, my email is the, it's, I probably should say it now, maybe it's Siege, but it's, it's, I think it's pretty obvious, right? First name dot last name at ASU.edu. Nowhere to hide, really. <laughs> so, let me know. Yeah, screen shirt, man. So time will tell, but one of the things that I am proud about in my career is being a good mentor to people. Um, not that that's particularly women, I'm pretty good at that. I need it because, um, not because there are any, but you know, just, um, just get out of my hole there. Um, I'm of the age, about put it back on me. I'm of the age, and I'm at the time in the timeline of my career that I'm really desperate to try to download what I've learned um, and share that with younger people who are going to take the reins and the next steps forward. And there are a lot of different ways of doing that. Over the course of my career, I've developed a lot of contacts. I probably visited over a thousand food production operations. I visited farms all over the world. I know a lot of people at the Food Agriculture Organization, the UN, yabba dabba do. Well, a lot of your professors are very, very established and connected. And I, like them, will seek to help people forge their careers in positive ways. I mean, I, I don't know what more to say than that. I may not answer your question, but, um, you know, the last thing I did last night before going to bed was I was writing a recommendation for a Fulbright for one of my students. That's what professors do. That's what our job is at the university, is to help our students succeed. I think it's out there on that big granite rock there, right? We measure ourselves not, not by who we exclude, but who we include in the measure of their success or something. I don't have it. Don't tell President Crow. I haven't done that specifically yet. But I buy into that. One more question. You're going to get a second turn? Okay, go ahead. Oh, you got okay. one. One in the back, sorry. Very much so. Um, more so when I arrived physically here, but in the short term, um, I've already been in contact with a couple of organizations. I've been in touch with the State Department of Agriculture. Again, I think that um, being engaged with the community, being a good citizen, sharing expertise has to be a part of it. That's what a public university does. That's part of our job, to engage and to use the assets that we have to improve people's lives. It's not a choice. All right, with that, I thank you very much for your attention.